My lovely free melons, thank you for joining me here once again on the Free Melon Society. I've got the distinct honor of having Mr. Damien Gardinik. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right, Gardinik? Pretty good, yeah. Ish. Gard There's Gardinik. a sound there that you don't have in English, so. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, say it one more time. Say it one Gardinik. more time. Gardinik. Is that uh, uh, so. in the oh, back okay. of the throat? Gardinik. In the back of the throat. Gard Gard Gardinik. It's all good. You can just say Gardinik. Yeah, my man, I I'm so happy that you're here. So Damien and I met last year at the UK Fruit Fest. Right. And I was really impressed with your workshops. And Damien is a, um, is a high raw plant-based chef, vegan chef, okay? Specializing in raw vegan cuisine. He also dabbles in non-raw cuisine as well. A masterful chef. Okay, very, very, very experienced, very, very knowledgeable. And I learned a lot from him and his workshops both last year at the UK Fruit Festival and this year as well. Mm. And so I was anxious to, yeah, I was, thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for your work. We will post all of Damien's information in the description. He has courses that he can offer you uh, to teach you all the skills that you would need to really, really, really take your food prep to the next level. Very, very helpful for anybody who's interested in this lifestyle. So I guess, first of all, I will say, yeah, again, I, I really appreciate your time here. And it's been a pleasure, you know, getting to know you these past two years. I mean, we've already, what, we've already shared tears together. <laughs> <laughs> you've, yeah. you've given me some really, really constructive advice. And so um, what we'll do, okay, so what we'll do today is we'll just go through, we'll go through a bunch of questions and um, hopefully we can start answering some curiosities that people might have about raw food cuisine. So the first thing I'll, I'll ask is, let's just talk about you first for a second. <laughs> your, your passion, okay? Um, how did you find your passion to become a chef, all right? Or in your case, a, a food sorcerer. I mean, mm. you, you put together some incredible, incredible dishes. What, where did that passion come from? <clears throat> I guess to answer that, I would need to go back to my childhood because growing up, I watched my grandma and my mom cooking, you know, and, and this is something that we do uh, as a society. We connect over food and everything, right? This is a way to show, show love and, uh, yeah, personally, I love everything that has to do anything with food. And and that means from growing it and collecting in a rare and all varieties of fruits and veggies, harvesting them, preparing them, cooking them, and then obviously eating them as well. But all of that just draws me in. I can't really explain why, but it's just it's just there and, and this is what, what really drives me. So I guess that's the definition of passion, right? Like it's it's something that drives us like this. It's like this inner fire. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and sometimes it's, it's inexplicable. Sometimes we have passions for things that we, we don't really know why, where they came from. Uh, but what you do know for sure is that there is just some sort of drive, some sort of information that you can't, that you can't <laughs> escape from. And then, then mm. where it takes you, that's, that's just what you do and you know, it's right. Um, so yeah, every, everyone has their specialties that they're always, that they're always uh, catering to with their energies. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you found this. Yeah. I'm glad you found this because, um, it's very helpful for me. If it was helpful for me, it's going to be helpful for, for everybody. Yeah. It's a very practical skill, right? For anyone. Right. Okay. So what would you say? All right. So now with that passion, what would you say your mission is? So, you mm -hmm. know, you have, um, you, you know, what, what does your motivation compel you to do? What do you, what do you see as a long-term goal as a result of your work? My mission on in this lifetime, do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Good question. So, I like where you're going. <laughs> in this lifetime. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I feel like my mission, my purpose is kind of in development. Um, you know, I'm, 
still re relatively young, right? And I feel like that is still um, in the initial stages and that I really feel this, that the big stuff is still to come in the future. Um, but it is all sort of related. And, and this is, again, tying it again with that passion and that mission. What I understand is that is like that individual calling of, of that why, why we're here on this plane, right? Like what, what is our calling in this lifetime? And yeah. it can be as simple as just following your passion, what really like excites you over and over again. And, and even more so, uh, something that you don't lose interest over, over time, you know? And for me, that is this, I love cooking. I love preparing food. I love permaculture. I love gardening, you know, and, and then I love bringing people together and cooking for them. Like that's something I find, you know, it's, it's a simple things of life. And I believe that because it's so simple, uh, and, and in particular permaculture gardening, permaculture involves so much more than just growing food. It's, it's mm. a permanent culture. And I find that there's a form of cure for so many problems that we have in the world right now in those things, you know, it is like when you sit, even just when you sit with someone, um, who you don't know, or maybe you don't even get along with so well over some good food, it's like all the differences just disappear. Right. And then you, you can find connections there and similarities and and gratitude and appreciation for each other and and so i, I find that that's you know there's something magical there yeah yeah definitely definitely there's this there's this <laughs> connection that you can make when you're sitting and eating with people and it's it's a very it's a very beautiful human thing although i would imagine this happens with animals too i, I would imagine it yeah. happens with with everybody you know who who has at least a, a certain amount of you know conscious development right right and well and, and speaking of that it's interesting because i always i always think like i i like to philosophize okay so i like to try to peer into the structure of certain concepts and behaviors and i like to try and find what's what's going on in the background right the subtext almost and with human beings, right? So we as human beings, we, we are the most consciously evolved organism here on the, on the planet. Now, uh, people might disagree with that. You know, people might say, oh, okay, well, dolphins. And, but, and, and of course, these, these animals are highly, highly, highly intelligent. Um, but there is, there is I mean, if, I'm sure you don't need much convincing. Just look around you. Look, look at the the degree of creativity, the degree of conceptual depth that the human mind is capable of. Mm. And animals are simply not capable of this, right? For one thing, the, the body is a reflection of the development of the mind. So mm. the way our hands are designed, I mean, these are just reflections of our conscious development where we're given the ability to create, right? and and reflect more qualities of the higher so anyway we could go down that rabbit hole for a while the point is what i'm trying to ask you what i'm trying to get around to asking you is mm -hmm. we have this tremendous capacity for creativity that capacity for creativity is our gift it is also our curse because it allows us to think of and act and behave and conceptualize in a thousand different ways that are departures from truth all right that are departures from from uh, nature's intention that are departures from health that are departure on and on and on it goes so it's this gift and this curse and of course with food culture obviously we're all, we're doing collectively something wrong because i mean just look at the rampant uh, disease statistics that are that humanity is plagued with that all the animals don't seem to be plagued with so my and this is why I, this is why i really really appreciate and and love 
your work, the chef craftsmanship <laughs> that you bring to the table. What I wanted to ask you, okay, given all that, is in preparing food and being creative, flexing that, that human creativity muscle, all right, taking raw elements, putting them, them together in specific ways, where do you draw the line? Where do you, where do you distinguish between too much processing and just enough processing so that you're not in violation of health principles? You know what I'm saying? I, I need you to help me flesh that out. Like, what, are there things that you, that stand out to your mind? Like, okay, this would be going a bit too far. And now we're starting to really interfere with health. This type of preparation is 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 still fine and good right if you know what i'm talking about yeah what are key things that you're looking for that we should know about to, that would signal too much processing not enough help me sort that out uh, this this might be a longer question but yeah it, it's uh something that yeah. i've always considered that is a very interesting question you know and as you were talking this is something that's been on my mind um pretty much since i began my journey with raw foods. Mm -hmm. And just like you said it, um, for me, this passion that I have about food and cooking has been both a blessing and a curse, just like you said it. Mm -hmm. And I've had this thought mm -hmm. for many, uh, for many years now. And, and there's a reason for this, you know, cooking is a form of art, just like painting or music, dancing, you know, it's like, it's not something necessary for survival, but it's a form of kind of like beautifying this reality and, and our existence on this plane, uh, kind of like a way of expressing emotions and I would say in particular love and gratitude, right? Um, and art is a, a, is a way, you put it also very well, like kind of like coming closer to God and expressing the beauty of creation through other creations, you know, our own creations and cooking and food culture is, is just deeply embedded in all cultures in the world, some more than others. Um, we come together to eat and share this beautifully prepared food. And this is an act of love and trust and, and to celebrate things, right? And personally, I just simply love cooking without any purpose. So it's, it's kind of like a creative outlet for me which is something of a very human need, I think, to express yourself creatively in one way or another. And, and for me, that is cooking that always been like the prevailing one. So you can imagine like when I started uh, learning about raw foods and eating more raw foods and uh, learning about our species specific diet that we don't need to cook or even prepare any elaborate uh, like gourmet raw vegan meals. And, and even more so, like the, the simpler the diet, the healthier it can be. It was all just very confusing, you know? And, and so when I started eating raw, I didn't have that creative outlet anymore. Uh, and I really struggled with that. And I think, you know, about my past with my eating disorder. And I believe this was one of the motives, like one of them, not the main one, definitely not, but one of the motives of why this eating disorder crept up on me back then. Because, you know, I didn't necessarily want or need to eat cooked food, but I didn't want to cook it, you know, just, just to let, let things out and, um, you know, be creative and, and just enjoy. Uh, I just enjoy the process so much. So also like how I often coped with stress just by cooking, just like any artist would, you know, with, you know, painting or playing music or whatever. So that's steered away a bit with, from your question, but. I would say, you know, finding that balance between like healthy preparations, you know, and pr processing it because any form of cooking, any form of preparing food is, is processing it. Right. So there's layers to this. Like we cannot compare a bag of potato chips with a raw salad or even with some boiled plain potatoes. You know, we cannot compare those. Right. It's, it's just like in complete different categories. Right. And so finding that balance, I find that this is um, a personal journey and the level of commitment that, that, we, that we find ourselves in and at each moment. I believe we have an innate wisdom within our body to know 
when something is too much. Yes. So our body will give us feedback when, you know, we eat something too processed or even I find that when we eat too simple and then we also fall into imbalance from another side, right? For some people, like they might just not be ready yet for eating that simple. They're just in that state of consciousness. But then we have also other tools, like for example, food combining charts, right? So we know more or less like that kind of guidelines that people have found out through experience and even science that tells us what is healthy, what is not, you know, like we know that fried food is not going to be good uh, for us in any form or shape. We know through food combining charts that certain combinations are not optimal for digestion Mm. or for just our physiology, how our body processes certain nutrients like fats and sugars, for example, right? But at the same time, um, those are guidelines. and, And I do believe that the mind plays the biggest role there. Right. So if we think, if we have this deep belief that something is going to hurt us in a certain way, you know, something's not good for us, it's, it's going to, we're basically programming our body to have a negative reaction to something, no matter how healthy the meal that you're eating is. And, and I think in the other way, in the other extreme as well, if you're eating something that is quite unhealthy on its own, but you have a very positive and healthy mindset about that and you eat it with gratitude and lots of love, it's not going to have the same kind of effect as if you ate it, you know, just being like, God, oh, this meal is going to be toxic. It's going to, you know, clog me up, all these things, you know, it's going to have a much more intense effect. So it's, it's a complex topic and, uh, and that's a complex answer as well to this question. Yeah. I, I think I cannot give you a straight up answer, you know, like a simple answer to this, <laughs> but does this answer your question a bit? Yeah, no, 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 definitely. I've, I've just been kind of like jotting down notes as you've been, as you've been talking and I, th- yeah, no, you gave me good answers here. So I think what we can come away with and for the audience listening, this is this is kind of how I like to approach these these dialogues. Sometimes, like I, I sometimes we don't really know the answers, but we can, because of someone's expertise, you can start to put things together and and come up with some general guidelines, right? So I think right. okay, now we have cooking. So we you mentioned that okay, cooking for sure is going to be some sort of some form of adulteration, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's frying like you said deep frying so i mean i i would consider that drifting into the health impairing world okay so that that i would definitely consider frying there with cooking obviously there's different methods of cooking some you know can be worse or or not as bad right so we know that but in general because i mean you would consider yourself a more in line with a high raw chef a high raw um, food preparation mm. uh, expert, really. What you also mentioned, though, is uh, that I kind of liked was that it's it's personalized, and that that is true because everybody is coming with a different level of damage, impairment, yes. baggage. All right, we'll just say baggage. Some people are missing organs. Some people are not. Some people have this organ system uh, damaged. Some people do, on and, and it, on and on and on. And, and on. it doesn't even have right. to be only on the physical level, but also on the mental yes. and emotional. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Like you said, placebo, right? People might have a bunch of food combining ideas. Okay. Correct ones, correct ones. But because of their fixation on them, mm. what they inevitably do is they end up causing a stress response. Yeah. And the stress is more toxic than the byproducts of improperly prepared food. Yeah. Right. So these are all there's all sorts of variables here. Yeah. And I think if we're talking about okay, where do we draw that line between health impairing and health promoting yeah. combinations, then what we'd have to do is you'd have to find some things are non-negotiable right so there's yes. there a certain amount of objective preparation principles yes but once you get into a certain healthy range 
you open up into a world of subjectivism where yes. it, it starts to be interpersonal and you have all these considerations to make. Yes. Uh, because some, some errors, okay, some errors in food preparation for one person might not be very health impairing and for another might be so so yeah so it's, i love i love your answer like you 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 gave me a lot to consider and think about there you you put it very concise my you know rambling ideas about this uh no and that was that was, <laughs> no, that was, that you, was you very were rambling. You were so, so you got it um and that's what i also believe that there's natural laws of things right so there's things that you cannot change. For example, fried foods are, is going to be unhealthy, no matter how you look at it. Yeah. You know, when we're talking about food specifically. But I believe that there is a bigger pattern that kind of everyone goes through in these phases. And for myself, it's also been happening. So, you know, eventually over time, I started enjoying simpler and simpler meals, you know, simpler tastes and, and simpler combinations naturally so no matter like if i experience like some cravings here and there for you know more complex more dense foods overall i just crave more simplicity it's some days even like the simplest of salads is already too much for me too complex all my body wants and all i want is to nibble on some like you know whole ingredients just pick some things here and there like a couple of tomatoes and couple slices of cucumber and maybe some kind of nut, like for example, an almond and kind of make the combinations in my mouth. But th it's a very different experience than making a dressing from those almonds, chopping all the, you know, tomatoes and cucumbers and mixing it all up in the bowl. It's a very different experience. It's, it's already much more complex. So that quality of ingredients started to become much more relevant. And especially I noticed this, you know, uh, when I pick things right from my garden or, or I go to the farmer's markets, um, you know, local stuff grown here. So I believe that this is one of the keys here, quality of ingredients. It, it really plays the biggest role in good creations, good culinary creations, more than all the complex combinations that make like a super flashy meal, you know, like like super like star chefs would make, for example. But even like the best chefs, like the truly best chefs, I believe that if they're smart enough, they will be humble enough to appreciate all the beauty of a good ingredient because they cannot replicate a good, juicy, sweet, savory tomato in the kitchen. They cannot make that or a mango or, you know, a carrot. God made those absolutely perfect and, and they don't need anything else. So no matter what lab experiments you make in the kitchen, that's going to win always. And I think part of this process of, you know, finding that balance is really appreciating the simplicity and the beauty of simple ingredients like this, which is, you know, a big part of the raw vegan movement. Right. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. You reminded me of, of something to add on to this. Um, mm. You mentioned like the food combine. Okay, so the food combining element have have you ever i don't know if you have or not have you ever had any experiences that would lead you to believe that some food combining errors are worse than other food combining errors for the audience we can't go through all of them all right yeah. don't mix your starches with your proteins don't mix the acids with the sweet fruits uh don't there's all there's a whole laundry list of food combining principles you just go onto the internet and you can you can source them out okay we don't you don't need us to do that for you here um my question for you damien though is yeah out of those in your experiences have you found that some combinations do you worse than others definitely but maybe not in the way that people imagine because this is something i see it's a big thing within the robbing community particularly uh there is an obsession about proper food combinations um, a negative obsession in, in that sense. So what I mean with that, they take the food combining charts, you know, they listen to someone or read a book, you should never do this, but they kind of stay there. They don't understand it, or they might understand it on a logical, theoretical level, right? Like, so, you know, someone told you like, you shouldn't combine sweet and fat because it raises your blood sugar, blah, 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 you know, builds insulin resistance, all these things. Uh, because both things need like a, a different 
uh, digestive environments, you know, we can go into those things, but they never truly experience it themselves. And I find that understanding things, you know, it, it, it means inner standing. So you have to experience those things as well. And one more thing about this is that I find that a strong, healthy gut and healthy gut microbiome, so all the little bacteria and microbes that live within our guts, they all help us to digest food. And I find that when we have a very strong one uh, and healthy and balanced one, we can digest things pretty seamlessly and you know we don't experience pretty much nothing at all and that's what i that this is my experience that said when i'm really in tune with my body i can tell when i've had something more complex or i've eaten maybe some fruit right after cooked meal i i notice you know like more gassiness or i feel more down or my blood sugar is all over the place so there's those things and this is where those food combining charts came from you know they came from personal experience and people trying to explain it in a simple way for everyone yeah i really think that that's that should be you know the requirement to understanding food combining properly mm -hmm. is to try it yourself for example you know when we go into the raw vegan kind of food charts you know where especially when we go into like very detailed different combinations of different types of fruits you know acid sub acid sweet melons well i've made banana and watermelon juice smoothies for weeks and i didn't experience anything wrong with that you know mm -hmm. food combining charts say never combine watermelon with anything so there's these kind of like more general rules you know fats and sweet yes you should avoid those i believe that it's also about quantity oftentimes like you know, one or two dates in a fat-based dressing, it's not going to affect you the same way as you eat two handfuls of each, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah um, it's, a, it's a much longer conversation about this, but I hope this, this, yeah, clarifies some things. Yeah, no, no, this, yeah, this is great. Yeah, this, this is great. I think that there's a natural... There is a natural evolution of self that you can't help but embark on once mm. you start cleaning up your diet and removing most of the flagrant offenses, and then you only start putting in the clean food. When, when that happens, your mind and your body are, are changing and they're reconfiguring. Mm. And in good time, if you continue going down that road, what the gift that you will be given is you'll be given a more reliable system to tell you when you're doing something incorrectly. Whereas you can't put your faith in your own senses when you're eating a, a conventional diet. Mm. But when you clean up, now you're, you're gifted the ability to actually rely on your senses. Whereas mm -hmm. other people can't, hey, go, go uh, eat what you like. Be mindful of your sensitivities and someone will be, like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll just go have a duck pizza or something like that. Yeah. No, you're just, you're just on drugs. You, your body, <laughs> your body isn't able to lead you to food properly. You need to reform your nervous system, your mind, clean out. Yeah. And then you can, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. And this is also a skill to like be able to discern what is, you know, like a, a craving coming from your mind, like I want a pizza versus what your body needs and craves, right? Like that's yes. a very subtle voice. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So I think in wrapping up this question here, from what I'm getting, I think I would tell everyone that, okay, first step, of course, is you need to reform yourself with a proper diet, right? Yeah. Once you get to the place where your, your system, your body is a reliable gauge mm -hmm. for what you should be eating. Once you get there, and that can take, God, who knows, six months, eight months, who knows how long that can take. But once you get there, then it's up to personalizing your yeah. experience and experimenting. Like you said, having actual concrete experiences of how badly some food combining principle if violated actually affects you 
and you'll be able to determine in your own experience oh okay so it's not so bad if i do this or in minimal quantities or oh but but when i do this oh yeah that for sure that's an error because i threw up right after after the meal or whatever or i got sick or i, I broke out into a rash or something like oh yeah i mean i've had those experiences where i absolutely know without question that what i did was an error i'm like oh okay that will that is certainly an error <laughs> and then other things were like okay i mean i don't it it feels different but it's certainly nothing like that other mistake that i made a yeah. while ago right? yeah. and so yeah and so i think that's i think that's what i would say is that you have to remove from the diet all the things that are obvious detriments and then once you get to a better place now there's a whole world of kind of subjective creativity that you have to figure out on your own because we're all coming from such a different i think yes. that's i think that's what i'm trying to say finalizing this this question yeah um any, anything to add to that anything that uh, comes to mind or you, you know? yeah just very quickly i mean um i think yeah um what are we talking about beginners like in any skill in any kind of skill they need so, some sort of rules and and uh, guidelines to follow because you just don't understand everything right. And and so this is where this comes in handy. Eventually, you will, you will gain experience, and we, you will be able to draw conclusions and lessons from your experiences. So just like you said, kind of summarizing that. Yeah, yeah, very well yeah, said. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. That's great. I mean, in, in in my life, for example, I mean, most of the time, what what ends up happening is I I, I want to stick to those principles. It's not it's not a it's not a chore. Yeah. Right. It, because it actually brings out the best in you and yeah. you start to be addicted to, to that feeling, having the best of you brought out. Um, so it, it, it's not like it's a difficult thing. But I'm also people might look at, you know, my life and say, oh, that, you're so strict. How do you deal with that? I'm like, no, I don't think you understand. I, I, I'm I feel like I'm like very relaxed and very open. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was eating just as much as everybody at the at the fruit festival. There's all sorts of wonderful concoctions. Like, I mean, what what am I going to get all stressed out? Like, oh, this you know, this is combined in an unfamiliar way. But no, I just if you have this, if you bring this kind of dogmatism to your life, you're going to compound with stress, and yeah. that is nobody needs that, right? Okay, feeding off of that, all right, along the same lines, in terms of just like practical advice, like practical things that people can can take away from this, what would you say are some principles of food preparation, if you've, if you've discovered any, right? So you've gone through all these experiences, making all these wonderful meals. Are, are there certain common denominators that you've been able to uh, recognize, like, ah, this is a common denominator that is common to all these uh, meal preparations that I'm making. Are there any general principles that people can know about what makes a meal a good meal, whether it's a salad or, or some other type of, you know, you know what I mean? yeah. Yeah, that's a great question uh, and a pract very practical one. Um, hmm. So, you know, I was a chef, a professional chef working in restaurants and so on for about 10 years. And, uh, yeah. you know, after that, working on my own for, yeah, just for myself cooking, you know, and uh, in that time, I, I've learned a lot of things and I started understanding like what, what made a great meal in general. So, you know, back then it was about cooked food and it was a combination of basic principles. So things like texture, balance with basic flavors, aromatics, you know. And I also understood a bit more about like the chemistry behind cooking, like what goes on behind all the different cooking methods, like boiling, roasting, and what those things are actually doing to the food and how it's transforming it. That was very practical for me to use then uh, later on in, in raw vegan cooking or even into veganism, right? One of the main things that I understood is cooking vegetables or grains, cereal, you know, like these things, cooking them uh, will make them slightly sweeter because the starches in those veggies will break down into sugars. And so they will be just slightly sweeter. 
And so knowing this, I know that balancing sweetness in any meal, whether it's a salad or raw vegan soup or any like dehydrated gourmet meal, having the sweetness balanced in there um, is is one of the key elements. And this oh, this sweetness can come in from like even just like what I mentioned before briefly, like a simple date or two blended into a dressing. Uh, or, or even some chunks of apple or mango or pineapple or pear, you know, any kind of fruit uh, into the salad. So that right, that right. was like number one, the sweetness element in, in those things. And then all the other flavors as well. So, you know, we'll have salty, sour, bitter, and also the fat component would be another thing. We need to keep those well balanced, but at the same time, there's so many possibilities you know, depending on what result we want, we can go in so many different directions and so many tangents, depending on what we want to right. imitate, because that's how my brain works. Typically, when I'm working on recipes, it's kind of I'm trying to imitate a, a, a flavor, a, a texture that I remember or, you know, from a dish that is, you know, from somewhere in the world. And if you remember from my workshops at the UK Fruit Fest, one of the key combos for like probably the best, you know, salads that you can make is to boost sour and sweet. So if you put like a ton of lemon juice or lime juice, plus some dates or something like that sweet, it's gonna just elevate the salad to the next level. Then the textures is also another one, right? Because that's also what happens with cooked foods. So when we eating salads, that's mostly gonna come from the different types of cuts. Um, so obviously, you know, you can picture this. You take a cucumber and if you slice it in a very, very thin julienne, it's not going to be the same flavor experience as if you take a, a huge chunk of cucumber and just eat it like that. It's going to completely right. change everything. And it's not only about the texture and chewing more, but it's also like how that flavor is transmitted to our taste buds and also the aroma into our nose. So yeah, and talking about aroma, I think a good salad particularly uh, if we're talking about salads, should have tons of fresh herbs in them. Dill, basil, cilantro, parsley, and any anything you want to name. It just brings it to a new level. Yeah. Besides, you know, adding a ton of nutrition and, and even medicinal properties. Yeah. But but just just one last thing. One like definite common denominator for all good meals, it's gonna be make the meal taste great. It's kind of like what I mentioned before, simplicity and quality of ingredients. We don't need to make crazy combinations. We just need to know how to combine them properly and to, you know, to get a, a certain result. We don't need a ton of ingredients. It's actually most likely going to do the opposite effect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That That's, that's interesting because I'm sure we all have those experiences where we bit into just high quality fruit or vegetable and it was just, oh my God. This is fantastic, and you could just yeah. eat, you just eat it as is. Simple combination. I mean, if you yeah. have a real sweet, like you said earlier, real sweet, perfect tomato, eating that tomato with just some celery is a completely different experience than having some crappy tomatoes from the. Yeah. It's totally, 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 totally different. And then if you slice up or dice the celery in thin slices. Right. All of a sudden now that's a different experience, too, because mm -hmm. now the juices soak in and start to make yep. So that's a totally different experience. And you're just talking about tomato and celery. Right. Yep. But the ingredients have to be high quality. And now it's just like, OK, balancing the flavors, like yes. balancing sweetness, sweetness balancing acids. Yeah. Right. But in particular. OK, so in particular, so we want to pay attention to balancing the sweetness. Um, yes. and then with, with an acid or a sour, or a sour, um, or a fat. that would, yeah. Okay. Or a, fat. Mm -hmm. or a fat. Correct. And then of course we're talking about textures and adding lots of herbs to whatever it is. So those, are, those herbs are going to, mostly to salads, mostly to salads and like fresh salad. things. If we go into dehydrate, yeah. dehydrated gourmet meals, for example, uh, um, that is a different world altogether. I see. Um, but in particular in salads, fresh herbs, just a, a new level, you know. And I'm not talking about like one sprig of dill in, in a huge bowl of salad, you know. <laughs> I'm talking about two handfuls full, like just right. 
put it in there. Yeah. <laughs> be liberal. Be liberal with yeah. the herbs. Forget. Uh, uh, yep. All of them. Yes, sir. What would you like uh, from the market today? Oh, uh, those herbs. Yeah, just uh, all of them. Yeah, just give me, give me the whole, give me the whole thing. I gotta make a salad tonight. So yeah, just, just all. Of them. We took your workshop at the UK Fruit Fest, yeah. and we made a whole. Uh, Damien also hosts retreats as well. I'll, I'll put all the information in the description below. Like I said, but uh, he also hosts retreats, and he, he also, you know, he's he's been at the UK Fruit Fest. I'm sure he's, I'm sure you've been to many other fruit festivals as well. Besides the UK Fruit Festival, am I correct in that? You've you've been kind of not, a bunch of Not a lot, but yeah. Um I've been chef at the Dutch Fruit Festival before and uh Thai fruit retreat with Grant Campbell. Yeah, a bunch of them. Nice. Not too many. Nice. Nice. Yeah, and um so with the workshops that he gives, you yeah, you end up learning a lot. So at the UK Fruit Fest, you you took us through couple workshops knife skills working with a blade and then of course um, making making salads yes and my question my question for you was okay so we have a, a, a salad right a, which is a, a type of food preparation style because people might not think about these things in, in this way but i would like to break that down as like okay that's a category of food preparation or, or a type of food in some way are, are there other general categories of food prep that you mm. would say yes all these things belong in this category all these things belong in that category and then salads you know there's thousands of different salads but they're all salads right think along those lines are there is there anything that stands out any other general categories that you know are, are good to name in our minds right in, when we're thinking about food should we stay within raw vegan kind of preparations ah uh, or do you oh, want to explain? Okay. Uh, because uh, let's let's stay let's stay within the robbing in world. Okay. You um, want to stay there? Okay, yeah, fine, fine. We can we can expand then later, but there's so many different approaches to this, right? And we can categorize it depending on like different criteria. But even within the salads, I, I consider there's so many different types of salads themselves. Like we saw even at the the festival with uh, with the workshop, you know, I try to portray different kinds. There's slaw is one different kind of salad you know then we could go into like the classical french uh, salad which would be like greens on a pl plate not even a bowl and then mm -hmm. some ingredients on top and then you pour the dressing on top it's a very di different experience but if we go outside of salad um things that come to mind dips for example so you make a thicker dressing or or something like a dressing and you cut bigger chunks of vegetables you know and dip in it's a very different experience. You can consider that a salad if you want, but it's a different experience. Uh, you can take the same ingredients that you put in a salad and blend them, and you have a roving in soup. So that's a different experience. Mm -hmm. you, can take you can take cucumbers or zucchinis or carrots, like longer vegetables, and spiralize them in, in a spiralizer, make noodles from them, and then mm -hmm. you have noodles. You can take a nori sheet and wrap them up. You have sushi or, you know, some other types of wraps. Um, you can take the ingredients that are not lettuce or greens from the salad and chop them up and take the leaf of lettuce, put things in there. And we have taco things, you know, so right. we eat them like that. Um, and and in the, within that, you know, like we don't need to go only for like Mexican inspired flavors, but you know, I've done like so many different kinds of things with this. So that's like the, the ones that don't require a dehydrator or any like further processing. It's just fresh ingredients. But if we go, you know, and have a dehydrator, we can go in so many different uh, directions as well, you know. And the main things that, you know, come to my mind when it comes to raw vegan gourmet dehydrated preparations would be things that you put in a food processor, you blitz them up and you have kind of like a homogeneous paste and then you form it into falafels or burgers or meatballs. And it's pretty much the same. You just change the spices or the main ingredients, you know, and you can go with mostly root vegetables or like things that have a lot of volume. So you could go for carrots, beetroots, pumpkins, even sweet potatoes even though they're a bit starchy, things like that. And, and you can form them into, into these things. You can go for pizza, you know, you just spread it out and then put 
toppings on that. We can go with right. uh, cauliflower wings or broccoli wings, which I, I like even more. Broccoli is so much more savory than cauliflower when you dehydrate it. It's so much better than cauliflower wings. Um, oh, really? Yeah. I like it so much more. It, they don't look as nice because, you know, broccoli is... It just turns like a brownish green, but the right, taste right. is so much better. Oh, we can go into okay. things like, you know, if we take mushrooms and uh, especially oyster mushrooms and king oyster mushrooms and we shred them with a fork and we create like a sauce and dehydrate them or even not like fresh can be also great. And we have things like pulled pork or pulled chicken. Um, we can take things that make chips and crackers from them, which are more like toppings or just snacks, you know, so many different things that we can go into. So I think, what, Is that what you were asking for? for yeah, yeah, just general ideas. So maybe like a pizza, for example, right? I could see that as there's a general category of some sort of starchy medium on which you put a whole bunch of things, right? right? Something like that, all right? And then within that category, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do, right? You, yes. That starchy medium can be one, like a wheat flour, okay, conventionally. Or, or it could be something else, right? It could be a cauliflower base. It could be a dehydrated uh, um, base, and then used to right. so so that type of thinking. I was wondering, I'm like, ah, what you know, what are the thing of the things that I'm eating? I guess what are the types of food mm. preparation that you that maybe chefs are have some sort right. of system that they categorize that I don't know of or that I've never really right. thought about before. That you know, that type of that type of so. <laughs> I mean, this is not exactly like, um, um, uh, how do you say it, traditional in any way. But I saw this oh. kind of funny meme or reel somewhere where people were categorizing all foods within basically four categories. And I think they were, oh. uh, everything is either a salad, a sandwich, a soup, and something else. I'm not sure. Mm. But, you know, like... A pizza would be a sandwich. Um, oh, I see. <laughs> you know, or uh, spaghetti would be a salad in a way because you're mixing everything together or, you know, things like that. Just to start wrapping up here, I think you're just um, maybe I'll ask some like really, really quick questions. You want to really impress somebody when they come over. Are there any go to meals that you would say, OK, this is the one I'm going for? I suppose it would depend on who I'm inviting, who's coming over, what their diet is like. But something that never disappoints is some form of tacos, uh, raw vegan or, you know, um, like lettuce tacos. That's what, what I, I mean. Um, mm. And it might be even like high raw. So I would make the meat part with mushrooms and other veggies and, and bake it in the oven, you know, with some spices and stuff. And then make a nice guacamole, a nice pico de gallo. And that's something that everyone has loved every time I've made it. And, and it's it's simple. Everyone loves that kind of food. It's also fun to eat. You know, you make it yourself. I, You know, it kind of brings people together. And, and uh, the good thing about that also is that you can personalize it. So, you know, someone might like uh, a bit more meat on that or someone might like more guacamole on on it instead and so you can accommodate many more people yeah sweeteners you're doing a whole food meal preparation you are missing some whole food ingredients what are acceptable replacement sweeteners if you don't have dates if you don't have whatever mm. um, honey you know for people using honey non whole food sweeteners that you would be Mm. okay using if you didn't have the whole food variety so it would depend on the preparation right generally i would go for some other type of dry fruit whether it's raisins or apricots or maybe dry mango or i would go for something you know very versatile uh in general it's very difficult to find the raw version of that but uh palm coconut palm sugar it's mm. um, it's an incredibly good option and i have it always you know doesn't expire because it's a dry product 
And what I like about coconut sugar as well is that it's very savory because, you know, it's made from the nectar that comes directly from the coconut palm. So it's full of those minerals that the palm is absorbing from the ground. So it's quite salty or savory, should I say, not salty. And so it adds a lot of flavor to a salad or, or any preparations. Really. Um, flipping in the other direction now with salt, let's say you don't want to use the non whole food type of salt. What are you replacing that with in order to get some sort of salty hit in your dressing? I mean, the, the first one is going to be celery. It's one of the saltiest vegetables out there. If I want to even go to the next level, I would take a, a bunch of celery, like a whole box of it, dehydrate it in, in small pieces, and then blitz it in the in a dry blender so I have a powder. And I have a really nice celery salt that's just concentrated sodium, organic sodium from the celery. And, and that is very versatile, quite neutral flavor. I would go for seaweeds as well. Um, so I always usually have wakame and nori sheets in, in my cupboard so i would use those but they do have some flavor depends on the preparations not they don't go very well with any just anything and then there's one uh sea vegetable so it's not it doesn't grow in the sea but it grows on beaches and uh you know like deltas so where there's salt water nearby it's called uh samphire S A M P H I R E, I think. I think I spelled that right. Hmm. And it's so salty, but also doesn't have oh, much flavor. It's 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 like you're eating seawater directly. Really? Um, <laughs> and it's quite popular uh, in gourmet cooking in like high end restaurants right now. You know, it has been become popular, but even in countries like the Netherlands, um, northern Germany. Uh, it just grows on the beach. You can go forage there, you know, Denmark, those places. Even in Spain here, I found it uh, as well, like tons of it. But uh, the best thing is, you know, uh, first of all, I'm, my mind is going all over the place. But um, in, <laughs> those, in those countries, I even seen it sold in supermarkets, but it's quite expensive, you know, so you can go forage it yeah. um, if yeah. you... Um, you know, you know how to identify it. It's quite easy to identify. Um, and then you can go and and pick a bunch of that and dehydrate it just like the celery, pulverize it, and you have really salty powder that you could use as a substitute. Yeah. All right. The last question I'll ask you <laughs> before we sign off here. Bread for making tortillas or pizza crust bread when we're trying to replicate the effect that bread has on our meals what have you found is the best way to do that is it a certain combination of vegetables that when dehydrated give you the breadiest type of effect what what would you say i'm, I'm trying to emulate bread what do i do um again depends on the preparations that you want to go for let's say pizza okay. Um, I would go for like the starchier vegetables, so like carrots or pumpkin, even beetroots, but beetroots have a lot of color. Um, mm -hmm. I would pair that up with some kind of fat, um, either almonds or walnuts um, and some kind of binder. So because these, you know, when you... When you process these things, they're quite loose and you know grainy, so they wouldn't stick together very well. Um, mm -hmm. But if you take uh, seeds that, when you soak them, produce this mucusy kind of substance, which is um, like a gel, you know, so things like flax or or chia seeds. You pulverize those before uh, you mix everything, you know, in a dry blender. So you pulverize those and then mix them in with the wet ingredients with the carrots or pumpkin, and it will just tie everything together. And you don't need crazy amounts of it, you know, to bring it to get together. So that's what I would go for. And then you would want to maybe spice it up in, you know, like, uh, again, balance the flavors, you know, with the sweet, right. sour, you know. 
aromatics and all that. That's what I would go for. And this bready kind of consistency, so some kind of like starchy uh, vegetable that is edible raw, so not like potatoes, you know, um, plus the flax or chia and some kind of nut or seed. And that's that's a pretty standard com combination to go for if you want to emulate bready things. Nice. Awesome. All right. Well, we're about an hour and 10, so... I think we can safely start wrapping things up. Covered a lot of ground there. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for coming and having this little chat with me. If you liked this interview, if you thought it was helpful and you would like to see maybe another round, you know, you can provide whatever questions that you think we missed, put them in the comments below. And then, yeah, maybe sometime down the road, we can do another session. That's going to do it for now, guys. So Damien. Any final thoughts, final last words? Really appreciate your time. Anything you'd like to say before uh, before we go? Nothing particularly that comes to my mind besides, you know, we talked a lot about food and it's one of the biggest things, you know, when we're trying to improve our health, our connection to self and, and to, to go out. But I just want to encourage you to spread out your energy into other parts of health, you know. So exercise, meditation, spending time in nature, all those things, they're also incredibly important, even probably more, I would say. But yeah, that's that's the last thought I want to leave people with. Yeah, it's a good mindset to cultivate, right? You, when, when we're making these changes towards better health, well, health is not a one-dimensional thing. Health is a, is, a, is a complete package of all sorts of lifestyle behaviors that go into supporting one another. So, you know, you can't, you can't have a healthy diet and then say, oh yeah, but you know, there's a little bit of social boozing and drinking and smoking, you know, on the weekends and whatnot. Yeah. It just doesn't work. <laughs> So it's a holistic, yeah. holistic approach. Yeah. 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 Beautiful, my friend. Beautiful. I appreciate you. Uh, look forward to the next time we get to meet. And guys, I hope this was constructive. Uh, subscribe to this channel if you want more stuff like this. There will be all of Damien's information in the description. And until next time, have fun, stay healthy, and God bless. Okay. Thanks, guys. Ciao. Thank you so much.